Welcome to another episode of Shortcast Over Coffee. Today's episode is a little special because for the first time on the show, I have a guest who is also a dear family friend. We have Dr. Annapurni Subramanyam, the director of Indian Institute of Astrophysics today. Dr. Subramanyam received her PhD from the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore and has contributed significantly researching on Magellanic clouds among numerous other areas. She's also an accomplished wildness. Today, we talk about her career, her meteoric rise from humble beginnings, the past, present, and future of astronomy, India's moon mission, Chandrayaan, and astrology. So let's get into it. Thank you, Dr. Subramaniam, for joining the podcast. Thank you for inviting me to the podcast. Thank you. Um, so you grew up in a musical family. Um, your dad was a Carnatic musician. Uh, how was that like and how was how did you get interested in astrophysics? Yeah, so I grew up in a place called Palakkad in Kerala. And uh, Palakkad is very well known for Agraharams. And there are many Agraharams there. And uh, I grew up in one such Agraharam. Agraharam would mean that uh, it's a kind of a street with row houses. And you would have uh, temples on both ends of the street. So historically, if you look at, uh, you know, the, the culture of people who lived in these agraharams, they were uh, kind of skilled in a few things. One would be like, you know, uh, uh, Vedas and uh, chanting Vedas and things like that. The, the other one would be like music. And third would be cooking. So there is, these are like, you know, uh, uh, the trademarks of people who live there. But then I also should point out that though these people had these three verticals, they had something ingrained in them called discipline because they had a structure of func certain function functions being carried out or you know, framework for carrying out things, your day-to-day -day activities, sticking to a schedule and making sure that you complete it. It's not like a major project, but it's it, it actually ingrains a sense of discipline in you and it helps you in focusing and making sure that you are at it, not like, you know, slip by, things slip by. So uh, in my parents belong to one of these were three verticals, that is music. And my father uh, was a musician. My mother was also a musician. And she was a professor of music in the Chambai Music College in Palakkad. So at home, uh, whether I like it or not, always music was there. So subconsciously, I have learned and absorbed everything uh, 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 regarding music, discussions, uh, uh, you know, people talking about general aspects of gossips and of course how you practice what happens if you don't practice everything everything goes around me so in between uh, I mean of course I have learned to sing and I also learned to play violin so uh, uh, so I grew up in that kind of an environment uh, I, I was breathing music all the time but I was interested in studies and uh, uh, at some point I think I it kind of was, I was feeling that uh, I want to make a mark for myself and also that uh, kind of a fear that if I will I rise up and you know rise above the standards of my parents so that kind of a thing if you are already in floating in something and if you want to make a mark and not uh, 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 not a, a blemish or you know uh, make them feel that okay I'm uh, giving them some discredit I don't want to do that so Either I have to be extremely high above the standards set at home or take another uh, line where it is, it's not, you know, uh, it's not traveled and make a mark there. So I was trying to, these were my two plans. So I grew up and kind of tried both the sense that I, I was playing violin and uh, company for concerts, etc. But at some point I had to make a choice that what I will do. So I decided that if I take up science and go ahead with it, then I can actually carry music with me. But if oh. I take music on and go, I cannot carry science with me. Okay, so you had to pick one one of the two. Yes. Yeah, it's yes. such a coincidence that uh, three of my guests, I mean, this podcast has only been around for a month and three of my guests have been violinists. One has been um, Kamal Kiran, uh, who's a young budding violinist and Krish Ashok. And I, have, I had invited... Krish for a completely different reason and we just 
ended up talking about violin and Carnatic music. And uh, I wanted to talk to you about astrophysics and, you know, coincidentally, you are also a violinist. So it's quite fascinating. Um, so, so growing up, you were interested in science, but I, I'm pretty sure, you know, uh, school days and maybe early college days, maybe astrophysics was not in your thought. Uh, was it physics? And then you shifted to astrophysics. How did that transition happen? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, see, uh, when uh, I grew up in college, it's not internet days. You, we don't have information. If you want information, you need to talk to people or uh, find out if there are any books available. And Palakkad being a small town, you won't have exotic books around or you, won't even, you don't even know what to read because someone has to tell you that go and read this. <laughs> it's, it's very difficult to find. So um, as you said, I was interested in physics because practically by elimination, um, I chose physics to begin with. But then I got interested and once I started doing experiments, I started liking it. Uh, but uh, the question is, what will I do in physics more, right? General physics, which you do in undergrad time. Um, we used to sit outside in the evenings. And, uh, you know, those days, there used to be power cuts. And there were no light pollution as such. So I used to look up at the sky and look at the stars. And I used to learn about constellations and identify constellations, how the constellations move with respect to months, you know. This month, I can see the constellation in the east, and this month, I can see the constellation in the west, etc. And also, I used to get up in the morning to study because the, the region where I grew up, it was very hot. So daytime is very, very hot. So you need to, the exams are always in the summer months. So we need to get up in the morning and then study. So I used to look up at uh, uh, a kind of a patch in the sky. It is like a cloudy region uh, towards the Sagittarius. And I did not know what it was. And the only thing I knew was that the cloud was there every morning at the same time. So it can't be an atmospheric cloud because it has to be outside the atmosphere, but I had no idea what it was. I talk to people, but they also don't know. I mean, nobody, I mean, it's not like a handful of people who uh, get up in the morning and then look up at the sky and say that, okay, there's a feature there, which, you know, it appears over and over again. So I did not know what it was, but it, it is actually the center of the galaxy. So you can actually see the map patch of the Milky Way. So I knew that it could be with the galaxy, but I did not know that was the, exactly the center and why the cloud is sitting there, et cetera, et cetera. I had no idea. So as you rightly said, it was not astrophysics as a term, but it was something which uh, I was interested in, but then it, it was actually astrophysics. Astronomy, mm -hmm. looking at the sky, understanding the positions, what happens there, what is out there. And I think there was that the same time when 1986, when Halley's Comet came. And uh, that also aroused a lot of interest and curiosity and things like that. Apart from that, in my master's, I was very, very interested in particle physics. So uh, as learning, I was uh, more interested in particle physics and um, you know the early universe kind of a thing and all that. So I did not know what actually would happen or um, uh, what actually would happen when uh, uh, the uh, uh, when I complete my master's actually. But what will, uh, uh, what was I, uh, what I wanted was that the, I wanted to continue doing something. I did not know what, but then I wanted to do research and the very idea of me stopping my education at master's level was very frightening was so lack of to... opportunities after master's or what what was the frightening no, part i did not know like you know the information was not available you have to look at the newspapers and you uh, you miss an advertisement you missed the last date and that's it over yeah so i have no idea and whom you will go and talk to there are only a handful of people and um, uh, people in the, in the university or the college had a little bit of information, but not much. I see. Interesting so, that you bring about uh, this uh, topic of having no light pollution, right? Back in the 80s. Um, yes, yes. Now that you look at the sky, uh, how much has it changed uh, with light pollution? Not just light pollution, smog and, and, and all of that. Um, yeah, just giving you an example, I'm staying in an apartment over here uh, uh, for the last 20 years or 30 years. 
and uh, I can remember, let me say, even last 15 years, 15 years back from my balcony, I could identify Pleiades and Hyades properly. Now, even that I can't do. So it's it, more light pollution and smog or what do you exactly. think? No, no, it's actually both. Not smog as such, but then the transparency in the sky is very, very less, quite uh, reduced. So transparency would mean that uh, any upper layer also, the uh, the the uh, uh, extension, with what we call it is the absorption becomes too high that you can't uh, identify. Even higher this, I'm not able to identify that constellation. So see it with naked eyes. It's, 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 it's really horrible. So I always tell people that the kind of things, the nature which we saw when we grew up is actually robed away from the new generation, cannot even uh, see it, what is out there. Mm. I also remember my dad fondly saying how, you know, the the power cut time in in, in India was was such a, a community time. People were talking to each other, you know, some, some people would listen to the transistor radio uh, and so on. Um, I've, I've heard him talk about it. Um, so going back to your education, um, post-masters, what was your PhD thesis on and, and what motivated you to do a PhD? Yeah, so the option after master's was either go and do a work job, take up a job or do a PhD. So I was not interested in doing a job because I was more interested in learning or doing things and stuff like that. So I, um, uh, uh, I actually another friend from Palakkad who's right now a um, um, a faculty or head of the Department of Mechanical Engineering in IIT Bombay. He's Vishwanathan. We were batchmates, actually. So he had joined ISC for master's and he had come home and told me that, no, no, you should apply to ISC. And he came home and gave me the application that I have bought it and given it to you. Now you have to apply. Because at that time, what happens is you are from a small place. You also get into this kind of a complex thing that, well, can you do it? Can you actually compete with others? So kind of a feeling bad about it. So uh, he said, no, 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 just go ahead and do it. So actually I wrote the entrance and got selected. And that time I had an option to join physics or astrophysics, but I think I was more tending towards astrophysics. And uh, I joined the Institute of Astrophysics through IIC actually uh, to uh, for the PhD program. So the, again, as I said, I knew that I wanted to do something, but I had no idea, you know, what I could research on or something like that. So we had to go through a year of coursework, two semesters where you have uh, uh, four courses per semester and need to clear, et cetera. Again, I, I was actually a bit scared because I wasn't sure whether I'll be able to make it because the courses were held at IAC and lots of students were there. But okay, I mean, you just have to do it. So all, what, all that I would I would talk to myself was just, just do it. Don't even think about the you know environment you're working on just you have to do it just do it so uh that time um, um I, I got more interested in uh looking up at the, i mean as i said i wanted to look up at the sky and the institute had uh, an observatory with telescopes etc so uh, uh, immediately i thought it's my first priority is to use those telescopes to look up at the sky and spend as much as time there so i was i was determined that i would do observational astronomy pick up a project and spend time in the observatory and uh, uh, this is uh, this a uh, kind of a, a little anecdote I can share. This that um, I was uh, uh, so I decided to go to the observatory and take up a project on star clusters uh, to study groups of stars regarding you know stellar evolution, etc. Uh, I'll talk about it. But before that, I when I said, told my mom that I'm going to do that and I'll be spending observatory time, etc. She they don't have any idea of what I'm doing. But then after a week or so, she came back and said. How about, why don't you study the sun instead of the stars? And she knew that, you know, we have a solar observatory in Kodai Kanal and you know, we are, there are also people who actually study the sun as such. I have no idea why she's saying this because um, uh, actually she wouldn't have any other way of, you know, finding out which way, which research is better or anything. So it, it finally, uh, uh, I realized that is because she didn't want me to spend night time in the observatory and stay away from home. Daytime means you can, you know, it's like a day job. You go there in the morning and finish. The sun also sets, your job is done. So that was a motivation. So I actually took them uh, later to the observatory and showed them what exactly it is and how exactly the environment is and how I'm happy there. 
so they re that really helped and they 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 all actually understood that i'm really passionate about it and that is why i'm um, i mean i'm doing this so that helped so i started working with the telescopes there there are there were two telescopes by then one meter telescope and a 2.3 meter telescope so the idea was to study a group of stars if you want to study the um, evolution of stars let's say sun like stars or massive stars or uh, uh, small stars they take a huge amount of time right so if you want to study how the sun would end its life, I mean, we won't be there. So, but we need to know what happens to it, et cetera, et cetera. So the ideal thing is to sample stars of various ages and study them, whether how it evolves. Just like, you know, if you want to study a man, a human being throughout its life, you will live through that life to study. it. That's not the way it is done. You sample people at various ages and find out how the evolution happens. So similarly, if you want to sample the stars at various ages and various masses, how do you do it? It's not very easy because stars are at various distances and uh, to get their properties. But if you look at a group of them, then it is easier to do because they all have the same property, same distance. So the only thing we changes with them is the, uh, the, uh, the mass within that. So groups of stars are very helpful in that way. So I was mo motivated to uh, understand this, uh, how stars evolve. And I used a bunch of clusters to study it. And of course, um, and then also we had to make simulations to you know, predict what the model says and uh, match it with what actually the data says and see whether what is the gap there. And uh, uh, so that was my fund one of the fundamental things which I was doing then. Yeah, mm -hmm. then I branched out to various things. But that uh, spent, I spent a lot of time in the observatory uh, though I did not build any instruments, but I understood because I had to use those instruments to get my data. So that gave me a very good grounding, uh, not only on astronomy and astrophysics, but also on telescopes, how things work, etc. How the oh. observatory works, etc. Okay, yeah, it's actually fascinating. Having spoken to uh, quite a few researchers and professors uh, who have risen up the rank, um, you know, it's it's so funny that a lot of them uh, took up a PhD or a research job uh, through pure coincidence. I was talking to a professor, uh, Professor Laktakia at Penn State. Um, and again, he had a very similar story that, hey, a friend came and said that you have to apply or, uh, you know, someone just said that, hey, you should apply, you, you're good enough. So in an era when there was lack of information, I think these kind of um, good coincidence definitely definitely helped how much of a difference was iasc in terms of infrastructure the quality of professors and and the lab from say something like a victoria college back in those days um yeah so it is uh, it is very very different because uh, in victoria college the college was uh, mostly of undergrad students and we had a just about a bunch of uh, five, six master's students, and there were no PhD students. So we are the topmost <laughs> cream of the thing. So uh, coming here, we are the bottom line, right? So because everyone is about either doing a master's or PhD or, you know, postdoc or something like that. So it is like you start from, you you got, get away from the top of it, and then you start from the bottom. And also students from various uh, universities, various institutions, and uh, um, uh, uh, so the way of teaching changes, the way of uh, uh, um, communication changes here because you're talking to a higher level. So you have to immediately ramp up your skill set, et cetera. Another point is also that the uh, communication was uh, mostly in uh, lo local language in, uh, in Victoria College. But if you come here, you have to talk, talk pe to people in English. Of course, it's not that you don't know English, but then the fluency and the, you know, immediately you you are free to talk. That, that freeness is not there. So you need to be a little cautious, prepare before you say, so, which takes a bit of a time. So in conversations or something like that, you will take a little backseat to come out and say something, not in a uh, outright kind of thing. But I think that was the time 30 years back it was, um, you can imagine, but then I think now it is completely different with the communication being so good, et cetera, et cetera. But that was one thing. And second is the awe. I mean, you're awed by looking at everything. Oh my God, this is so grand a place. So how do you actually uh, 
can you do this kind of a thing so something like an imposter yeah. syndrome right yes yes so yeah. so then uh, again with the students around also can you do this kind of a thing so but as i said you are there and you all know there's no way you can escape it and that's what you want to do it so just better do it right so that is how uh, yeah start off with doing it yes yeah okay yeah it's um, like i i guess like when you first went to bangalore you you probably knew english but at the same time like you mentioned about communication right you would probably have what you wanted to say in the local language and every time you translated before you communicated to to the other person um very cool um so now going back to astrophysics uh, i want to understand what is the difference between astronomy and astrophysics is astrophysics the modern version of astronomy and if you could um, probably touch on how history evolved and and where we are today that will be awesome yeah so astronomy is an ancient science in the sense that you also should put all these in a proper context so i want to mention from that point of view that if you look at historically the way science is done it has changed enormously okay the also the way in which science was perceived also is very regional in the sense how we perceive science in india is very different from how people perceive science in the west so those contexts we need to keep in mind but astronomy per se was i mean is an is the ancient science right because when uh, you have to look up at the sky and you sun is the source of energy to you and then your daily life is dependent on that and the uh, night sky is uh, you need to understand the stars because you need to find the time and also the direction if you want to go from one place to the other so these were uh, life skills astronomy you need to know if you want to survive astronomy is a life skill but now it's gone because you don't need and you have outsourced those skills to gadgets they're still there all that you've done is you have outsourced it to gadgets that's all but it is still there so we are still within the umbrella of the celestial sphere where you have all these things and we need to be aware of it and know about it and also we are not see that is when you start thinking that are they controlling us it's not like that it is this we are part of it so we need to understand each other right so that that's it that's where it stands so astronomy as such is the looking up at the sky and understanding the positions why they are how they are etc but when you can uh, chart out the locations of various patterns or you know the rise of the sun and the setting of the sun why it is moving etc etc the question is that you get to know that this is moving that's astronomy but why it is moving astronomy cannot answer why it comes from physics okay so so yeah. so so the the whole astrophysics part of it was was not just uh you know the advent of telescopes is is not the differentiator between astronomy okay. and astrophysics mm -hmm. it's 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 the reason as to why something is happening is 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 the differentiator yeah why is the differentiator because why tells you why you need to figure out that why is the sun uh, appears to move from north to south to north to south every season right why is it why do we have seasons so then you start figuring out uh, okay this happens this happens periodically yes it is happens periodically what periodicity does it happen then you put it out then you say that figure out they saying that okay this is what actually happens and then you have to then you know that this is this is what is happening again why is this so you go into multiple things and you go into quantitative to qualitative to quantitative now why is it that the sun is uh, the, the the earth is held in a position with respect to sun so then the forces come you know then the masses come etc etc so then you start putting in so that goes into qualitative to quantitative so these are steps you take one by one by one but originating from the question of why interesting so telescopes are an integral part of astrophysics can you can you tell me about the evolution of telescopes uh, from let's say early 1900s to 
how we are now. Uh, and the reason why I'm asking this question is I happen to visit a couple of observatories and I did not have any idea that, you know, observatories function so automatically these days with, you know, astronomers doing it, everything remotely and everything is just recorded in the computer and, and, and so on. So there is literally no one inside the, inside the observatory. So could, could you walk us through, through how telescopes have evolved over the years and how were they back in your time versus now? Yeah. So um, the telescopes, I mean, starting from uh, the small telescopes, when Galileo started to, I mean, uh, you start looking at the sky, uh, the, there were smaller ones, handheld ones, and there are big ones which were used during eclipses, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. But there are two types when you, you have lenses, when you can put them and then you, you know, you or get it to, through the same uh, same tube. So when you say telescope, you refer, I mean, for some people, the, the 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 image which comes to your mind will be a tube. Some people, it's a dish. I do not know whether dish is still uh, comes to a uh, mind or not, but tube is there, right? Tube is something which you Im immediately think of a telescope, right? So the tube, what does the tube have? What does it have? So these have optical elements. Basically, it has to collect the light and bring the light to a focus. The point is that the eyes are too small to collect the light. So in, instead of the eye collecting a smaller amount of light, you need to have larger amount of light collected from the telescope. Second, you need to have a, a recording mechanism because I cannot record or accumulate uh, um, a, images over a time, line, time scale. So you need to have a recorder where that can accumulate data over a time scale. So these two are important. So technology to increase the um, size and changing from a lens to mirror because if it became bigger than um, blend, you cannot make huge lenses, it becomes too heavy. So it changes to mirror, then polishing the mirror and then making it uh, reflective and then collect the light. So camera, camera is also needed there. So these were the initial, um, initial ad um, advances. Then around uh, in the, I think in the, it was during the second uh, world war time, the light out time, the uh, observations of the uh, Andromeda galaxy. At that, that time, the Kodak uh, films were changing. So they were mostly red sensitive. Then they also brought up the blue sensitive films. So when they put the blue sensitive films, the picture of the galaxy actually quite changed. So then, see, then they knew that there are, there's another population of stars, which actually blue sensitive. And they call them as population uh, 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 Two, but actually it is the uh, other way around. So population one, two, and three they call, but it's, it, it becomes the opposite uh, in the, I mean, basically the sequences of population started coming from there. And uh, then the entire thing changed. I mean, obviously this is a technology driven um, uh, uh, field. So you have to manually go there and to this little telescope, open the shutter, open the dome, and then set up everything up and then start moving the telescope though the telescope may have some drives to you know mechanical drives to actually track the stars but still you have to something called guiding because that's not finally at the same star so if this is a slight change in the motion then you will not get sharp images you'll get blurred images so one has to manually sit and guide so these kind of things were still there when i was doing my phd uh, is no automation as such. But automation started around uh, 2000, like in our case, the we established a telescope in the Himalayas, two meter telescope in 2000. And th that is the height of 4,500 meters above sea level, half the height of the Everest, Indian, in, uh, in Ladakh. Uh, so it is not easy to go to that place. And uh, the observer who wants to access the telescope and collect the data, cannot go there and travel because it's it's too long and then uh, somebody has to acclimatize and then only you can go there, etc. So the condition was that it has to be remotely operated from Bangalore. So this telescope is automated, but you can actually control it from here. You can give it coordinate, which coordinate it should look at, which part of the sky it should look at, what instrument to use, which filter to use, how much exposure time you have to give, etc. You can give it and immediately you can see the image also. This display also you can see. So this is a remotely controlled uh, observatory uh, uh, functioning for the last 23 years, actually. 
we also have, let's you said, automated telescopes where you can actually put in the scheduler. Like by evening, you decide that this is the kind of part of the sky you want to see through the night. Okay, there are some 20, 25 objects. And what is it you want to do? You point to that part of the sky, you start exposing in this um, filter or uh, you know whichever instrument you want. And then move to the next, do this. Move to the next part, do this. So you can actually create a commanding sequence, a script, and upload it. And uh, it starts doing it from the evening and morning, it ends it. You can interrupt if there is a sky condition failing or you know if it's a cloudy sky or something like that. Otherwise, it just goes through. So these are uh, automated telescopes are also there. There are many of them actually. I mean, we also have one, but throughout the world also many of them have. So uh, these are uh, again technology because the communication you need to, either you upload it through a satellite or you upload it uh, when you're doing an online uh, thing, we need to have a, um, a bandwidth from satellite available when uh, direct control is, uh, uh, real time control is being carried out. So these are these are definitely there, but uh, um, the paradigm shift happened uh, in the last twenty years when when I say I'm an astronomer and I'm, I say I'm, I'm an observational astronomer, I have spent time at the observatory handling things and being there. But now nowadays you don't need to go to the observatory at all. You still be handling data in a different way. I see. And uh, so, so, so interesting that you that you say that you know you don't have to go to the observatory, but there are still a few people stationed there uh, for some maintenance work and and things like that. Yeah, so we do have uh, people engineers in in the Hanley in the observatory in Han at Hanley. We don't have scientists; we have engineers. So we engineers they power up and then they uh, leave the give the control to. Bangalore and the scientists sit here and then take the data. But we have the observatory in Kavalur, which is near Vellore. There we actually go and uh, take the data and uh, come back. Mm, because so, it's more accessible and, and within the within the mainland, right? Closer to Bangalore and whatnot. Um, yeah, the other the other thing I wanted to know was, you know, astrophysics and astronomy is, is being done by so many different countries. And there are so many different observatories around the world. Is there any coordination or knowledge transfer between, let's say, a Griffith Observatory or a Lick Observatory in America with the one in India? Do you guys share information and learnings with each other? Uh, yeah, good question. So regarding, uh, uh, I mean, let me also tell you how it evolved. Like we have this observatory in Kodaikanal, which is basically to look at the sun. So if you're looking at a sun, sun observatory, uh, observing the sun, Sun is there everywhere and you look at the sun. So everybody will, <laughs> what is that you're doing? So you need to have some coordination, et cetera. But historically, if you look at it, that observatory was established in 1899. And the data was collected over hundred years or so. so we are still, still functioning. So next year we are celebrating the 125 years of its uh, uh, establishment. And uh, the data collected in earlier years were in photographic plates. Now we have digitized and uh, uh, calibrated and, and it's available actually in public. But in those days, if you look at, you need to actually, they used to be bulletins, observatory bulletins, and they were shared and they would, everybody would go to, uh, I mean, see the bulletin, what they have given, so in print and then take up, et cetera, et cetera. Now the data sharing is on project based. You could do uh, 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 like, you know, there are, there are places where you publish the data publicly and you can access the data from there. Or you can actually conduct programs where it is a coordinated program. So what is that you're coordinating? You need to look at because uh, this. If you look at sources which are uh, not changing with respect to time, then there is no time coordinated requirement. You can take data from whichever facility you want, whichever time you want, and then you combine the data. That's possible. So the th two things have changed drastically in the last two decades. One is uh, looking at an object in a multi-wavelength. Like if you want to study the sun, you can see the sun in the optical wa wa wavelength range, visible wavelength range. Do you stop it there? No, because sun, there are also features you can study from X-rays to UV to optical to infrared to radio. So you have to combine it because there are features which are, there are mechan physical mechanisms which are producing uh, uh, photons. 
So the emission mechanisms are different in these wavelengths. If there is an emission mechanism present there, which is of high energy nature, then you need to understand what is that mechanism and why sun has that mechanism. So the holistic understanding of the uh, processes, physical processes that is happening in sun, for example, will come out only if you have the coverage of all the wavelengths. So multi -wave this is example of sun. But if you look at any object for that matter, the multivalent studies become very important because you there are features which are there unless with, without which you the the information on that object or the physical process is not complete. Okay, point number one. Point number two: there are dynamical processes, which is called time series or you know time domain astronomy. It's called. So these processes require coordinated or uh, data taking in all the wavelengths. So this is quite challenging. So that is when the coordination and cooperation between even ground-based and space-based observatories are required. So large campaigns are carried out to understand this multi-wavelength times uh, time series data. So cadence, high cadence data to understand the mechanism which is happening at that instant. For example, uh, an eruption in the sun or um, uh, a, a, a feature around a black hole, active galactic nuclei, an accretion which is happening, there is a burst of energy. Why is the burst of energy happening? Explosion of stars called supernovae, gamma ray bursts. So these are transient events, which are of uh, a different nature and which need require coordinated observation. So these two have become very important. In fact, if you look at gravitational wave, the optical, the, the you know, the multi-messenger astronomy, where you have to, if you are identifying a, the optical counterpart of the gamma ray burst, or rather the LIGO gravitational wave source, then you need the multi-wavelength, multi-instrumental, multi-observatory campaign. So these are the ways in which the uh, discovery space and the collaborations are moving. So if I were to sum it up, um, there is coordination between uh, observatories, especially because of time series or or time domain astronomy uh, and, and you cannot have just one observatory uh, be on its own you know collecting data without without coordination okay, okay. interesting um, so i want to now come to chandrayaan um, and you have been invited for a lot of you know talks and i i see you in the media um, uh, talking about the importance of chandrayaan uh, three and 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 India's uh, moon moon mission. What has been IIA's contribution in the mission? Uh, not just Chandrayaan, but also Aditya. Uh, would love to hear uh, your thoughts. Yeah. So um, in the case of Chandrayaan three, the institute has not contributed as such in it. But I have been part of committees where. Some reviews have happened, and you know we discuss um, uh, uh, the uh, readiness of mission, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I was part of it. But if you look at the Indian Institute of Astrophysics, the our USP has been um, building telescopes, observatories, disseminating data, and carrying out research with it. So we have been. Uh, um, I mean, as I said, our the oldest observatory of 125 years. We are still functioning. I mean, it's still functioning. We are operating it. We have this 50 years, more than 50 years old uh, observatory at Kodai, sorry, Kavalur, which is near Vellore. And we have a radio observatory to study the sun in Gauri Bidanur. Then we have this Hanley observatory, which is uh, will be close to the uh, uh, Silver Jubilee soon. So these are the ground facilities. And uh, um, we have a large team of engineers who are skilled in optics, um, uh, electronics, mechanical, and et cetera, because Without their support, we cannot function these observatories as such. And of course, a good number of faculty, postdoc, and students who carry out research with it. Now, around um, the, I mean, two decades ago, we started uh, 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 partnering to build space instruments also. So, the first delivery of the space instrument called the UV Imaging Telescope, which is a, 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 about a, a twin telescope. To, to study the um, space uh, or the emitting images in the ultraviolet because you cannot see ultraviolet from the ground. 
It was flown in the uh, first Indian uh, uh, space observatory called Astrosat. It was launched in 2015. So the Institute uh, uh, um, delivered this um, UV imaging telescope in 2015. It took uh, about 10 years to build it. And we also set up a kind of a space sciences laboratory where it's, it's got clean rooms and all the facilities and you know laboratory where you can actually integrate everything. And then delivered it. It's still operational. It's all completing eight years. And I was there as a calibration scientist. So that 10 years of working on that particular payload gave me, gave me a lot of insight into understanding how space instruments are made and also how launches are made, what kinds of you know, uh, things are required for mission operations, and also data downloads and data processing in the case of space payloads. And from 2015, we've been building the coronagraph, which is flying on the Aditya L1. So in the case of Chandrayaan-3, uh, uh, the most important thing is in the uh, understanding our solar system, which has become of paramount interest because we also now know that many such solar system exist outside the sun. So there are many theories of formation which have now been, uh, you know, uh, uh, which we thought we can take it for granted, but that's not so when we look at the outside solar system. For in the case of, you know, Pluto was a, actually a, a planet. Now we don't know that it's not a planet. It's a, a, so these kind of things happen when you look outside and look at similar systems. So uh, understanding that uh, those kind of things is important. Second thing is, as I was mentioning all through my uh, talk, astronomy and astrophysics is about collecting data remotely. It's called remote sensing. You never go and touch a thing and collect, you know, touch it and play with it. But in the last decade or so, it is changing. With the Hayabusa missions by Japanese, we actually have uh, taken things out of the asteroid and, uh, uh, you know, scooped out material brought to Earth. And we are now analyzing to understand what's going on there. So this is one way of handling the material. Second, in the case of moon, you actually can do an in-situ measurement. The way things are there and this pristine conditions without altering it, you are making measurements there. So this is a paradigm shift. The way in which, you know, experiments can be carried out in uh, uh, astronomy, astrophysics and planetary sciences for that matter. So it's a complete shift in the way you approach an experiment or approach a problem. So I think that is what uh, I, I my take is about the Chandrayaan-3 and India's capability in foraying into, uh, I mean, demonstrating that one can actually carry out ex experiments in that way. So mm. that's very important then, yeah. With Chandrayaan-3 and the and the discovery of you know, elements of water in, in Moon, do you think moon will be colonized before mars and is there a possibility of you know human habitation happening in moon anytime it is uh, it is not an easy terrain moon is still quite difficult compared to mars actually yeah okay so mars seems like a very realistic possibility compared to moon but mars is far away so <laughs> <laughs> Oh, at yeah. least in relative terms. Um, yeah, so you're basically trying to look at moon, whether you can make it into a, a, a station. So it's like one hop point. Hopping point to some other uh, place, like uh, Mars is the uh, nearest possible thing you can do. So you can probably go to Mars. But what you can achieve in a very... See, right now, the exorbitant... Um, uh, cost in which you need to actually carry out something is uh, outweighs all the possible things to do it now. But then uh, that has always been the case when you start something up, right? Mm -hmm. It like, looks longer. Yeah, yeah. And, and like some people say, you know, Earth is, there is already so much in Earth and it's not that bad of a planet to live in. So why why take all the effort to, you know, colonize Mars and, and so on? But you don't know what happens and then you need to start thinking about the future and you can't be short-sighted. That's also true. Yeah. Um, and, and talking about water, uh, can life exist without water? Like can can any other form of, um, I shouldn't say life, but um, 
you know when you talk about aliens or or when you do exploratory research uh, looking for life in other planet is is water the fundamental indicator that hey the, it may be possible so what we are talking about is the life as we know it there may be something else that we don't know right yeah we do not know we cannot say we cannot even imagine or we cannot even parameterize a life without carbon based or you know the way as we know it so all that we can explore is right now we we probably are not like exploring for aliens but exploring for uh, habitable planets where with earth like conditions because we are more familiar with that yes yes so the same thing because of that the uh, uh one of the uh, in the propulsion module in chandrayaan 3 the there is a camera which is looking at the earth like you are looking at the earth from far away and trying to identify features so those features will be identified and used when you can actually have exoplanet features when you have do you have these features there so you you have to look at yourself from a distance okay yeah that applies to life too uh, i guess yes yes yeah now uh coming back to astronomy and you know solar system and planets uh in 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 india you know it is so much tied to things like astrology and uh you know predicting the future and and so many other superstitious things right um having been a scholar of astrophysics uh, what is your take on that uh, do planets really have an influence on what happens to us in the future uh so let me put it back in the context of evolution of this uh, jyoti shastra so if you look at what the name it's called jyoti shastra jyoti shastra has been uh, evolving in a very long time in india and before stepping to explain um, astrology as you term it i wanted to bring in the context of our culture as well if you look at our culture your calendars everything is actually built around the uh, celestial bodies we have uh, the calendars which are based on either the lunar calendar or the solar calendar right so even when you look at uh, uh, your rashi or you know the nakshatra they are nothing but the quadrants or rather the partitions in the sky okay so uh, the way in which the shastra evolve is actually taking measurements making if you look at uh, historically india has contributed enormously to mathematics to understand you know they're all in angles and if you actually somebody was saying that if you want to if you geometry is there and you want to a trigonometry if you want to explain just walk outside show them the sky and try to figure out the angles that's the best way to understand why the heck are you doing this so uh, there were huge amount of uh, uh, research done developmental work in terms of mathematics to actually understand this angles precisely and they were all not written in the language that we understand now they're all in sanskrit in verses actually even in local languages if you we, we are we were looking at some historic documents in canada when they are written in canada voices so it it is important paramount importance for us to capture that knowledge this there was a knowledge there i'm not talking about terming it as you know astrology but there was a knowledge out there that knowledge was used to actually develop mathematics and physics along with it but how you use that knowledge is a different thing now i want to use that knowledge to find out how we understood it at those times as a matter of you know uh, interest and document it understand that this is how we actually evolved and which is part of our culture as well but if you want to use it to predict this on a statistical basis that's that's a different matter altogether right it's you know stock market you have a data now you're trying to use that to predict that what will happen right so the if you once you have enough data and enough uh, uh enough uh, uh, equations to model it it's human intuition to see can i predict something but that will may or that's cause god 
probability of both you know negative and positive probability but statistically one has to understand so it is a statistical thing but then you cannot validate it so you cannot extend beyond certain things but we had that knowledge system we had the culture of observation we had the culture of interpreting it and also doing a mathematical modeling of that that existed and which is part of our uh, uh thing as well if you look at i mean you can interpret this like you know you so you know your birth time and that birth time where was sun in the whole universe at that time which constellation was it which part of the sky was it which constellation was it with respect to your location what what is the significance of that in in a person's life uh you know no, while appreciating it's 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 just that you know the 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 universe or the things are moving it's dynamic so when a person is born in on earth with respect to your coordinate system where things were that's all it says but if you want to use it as a predictive thing i i i don't think that's science because it's all has its own uh, uh, pros and cons because uh, but forces which are like over interpretations like if i say that um uh, two people sitting here or you and me this large distance between us right now but with respect to jupiter for that matter or saturn that distance between us is negligible we can practically be together and someone comes and tells me that my day today will be determined by saturn in positive way but your day today will be negative and the influence is from saturn that doesn't make sense because they are so far away that the the influence of theirs on us is so minuscule something like a you know gravitational force right you do not the gravitational that's the only force i can think of that's minuscule point number 1 two the gravitational field should be the same for me and you it can't be giving opposing uh, uh results because you happen to be born on some other day or something like that so it is it is not like that the the forces do not have a, a what do you say a, a memory of the history right it's the present situation which is actually the forces are uh, based on that so i mean that's what physics says yeah that that, that <laughs> final point is uh, is very very valid i think you know while appreciating the enormous contribution uh, in the field of science and math uh it is important to not use it beyond a point to predict what will happen in the future yeah so we should not diminish the uh, thing because that is over overriding it right so that's not what that is how you use it but that knowledge what we captured and we have we had was it's immense yeah and 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 also for the most part you know a lot of the things were not even documented you know it was all orally transmitted um, um also in in voices is very hard to crack yeah and it's 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 crazy how uh you know it sort of found its way through generations i think that that definitely needs to be um, appreciated um you know the oral culture and our that is what i'm saying this this discipline which these people i mean set of people had this discipline made sure that the knowledge is at least the way they carried was transferred okay very fascinating um well um i want to conclude this podcast with um you know like a 101 on indian institute of astrophysics um what does the institute do and uh, what are the what are the ways people uh, can engage with the institute as a student and otherwise yeah so the institute is an autonomous body under the department of science and technology and we are not a deemed university or a university so we are um, as the name suggests very specialized in astrophysics and related areas and uh, uh, our mandate is to uh, build instruments or observatories and carry out research in astronomy and related fields we have phd programs and mtech phd program in astronomical instrumentation and the degree is awarded by the the university with which we are partnering and uh, we have a bunch of scientists who do uh, uh, who do research in astronomy in wide variety of areas 
starting from sun and solar system to cosmology. We also have instrumentation people who carry out, you know, in related uh, research and instrumentation and developments. We have engineers, engineering sections, and uh, several observatories, uh, like, uh, you know, we manage certain observatories, which I mentioned, and also the space ones. Now we have two, uh, one in the uh, near Earth orbit, the low Earth orbit, that's 650 kilometers. Now the second one, Aditya is flying to L1, which is the 1.5 million kilometers away. So we expect to get the data from it in the next uh, few months. And India, it's, sorry, IA is also the nodal um, institute for the 30 meter telescope project. So it's actually the, uh, it is supposed to come up in Hawaii as a possible uh, location. And in, in the US, uh, the Caltech and uh, University of California observatories are partners. And we hope the National Science Foundation will also become partner. And uh, Japan and Canada are partners to it. And India has 10% contribution. And 10% uh, contribution um, is about 1,300 crores. And uh, the contribution in terms of uh, um, uh, hardware and software and instrument. And mainly we are actually the 30 meter is comprising of 492 segments of mirrors, small mirrors. So you can't cast a single 30 meter uh, surface of a single mirror. So of the 492 segments, we would be polishing the uh, surface configuring about 100 of them. So the new technology to do that is being, uh, you know, we have a technology transfer and the, the facility to polish these mirrors are, is coming up in one of our facilities. We are also engaging with uh, 70 odd in, uh, uh, companies to deliver the hard com com hardware components, like supporting all the mirrors is India's job. So for all the 492, segments you have to support to actually support and make sure that they function like a single mirror mm -hmm. so that all the things are made in india by industries and uh, so this is a big project and we are we are the uh, coordinating institute along with uh, a couple of more institutions in the country and we also engage with uh, other institutions as well as industry in this we are also setting up a planetarium in uh, mysore um, yeah, so this is a, the first uh, um, tilted dome uh, planetarium with LED dome because, so this is the first planetarium in the world. With, it's a tilted LED dome planetarium. Uh, the, in, in, the normal planetarium will have an inert, uh, it's like a, you have a dome which is inert and you actually uh, project the images of the movie uh, to this dome. Now, this one will not have projectors, but the dome will be panels of LED. So you can actually uh, control each LED through, I mean, through electronically. So the, the power is uh, large, your dynamic range is large. So you can actually, the, 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 the um, high resolution and high dynamic range images can be displayed. So it's the first of its kind one coming up. So we expect to complete in about a couple of years, maybe a year and a year from now. Oh, that uh, must be a great, uh, great thing when it comes up. Uh, looks like a lot of great collaboration that IIA is doing and a lot of exciting future plans as well. Uh, Dr. Subramaniam, thank you so much for your time. Uh, it was great talking to you and thank you so much for sharing your wealth of information. Um, I'm pretty sure the listeners would love it. Thank you so much for inviting me in the podcast. Thank you.